If you think stoicism is kind of about an indifference or a superiority, you're missing what I think Marx really talks about most beautifully in meditations about being strict with yourself, tolerant with others, really trying to practice empathy. He doesn't want his heart to harden up. Few care about the marches and countermarches of the Roman emperors, the philosopher Bran Blanchard would say. We don't care when they lived, what they did, all of their names sort of blur together. He said, but for some reason we remain fascinated by Marcus Aurelius. And why is that? Because of what the emperor of the Romans sat down to write in the midnight dimness, because of the rare ideals that this spirit lived by. And I think that's right. Marcus Aurelius was an extraordinary figure, a philosopher, king, a wise person who also had power and influence, who proves to us that absolute power does not have to corrupt absolutely. I'm Ryan Holiday. I've written a number of books about Stoic philosophy. I've been lucky enough to speak about Marcus Aurelius to the NBA and the NFL, sitting senators and special forces leaders. I've been a student of this great man for almost 15 years now. In today's episode, I want to talk about what makes Marcus Aurelius great, but I also want to share some really profound insights about Marcus Aurelius' greatness from philosophers and experts and students of him that I have been lucky enough to interview on the Daily Stoic podcast. Enjoy. One of the things that was really fascinating was the value that he placed on forgiveness. He famously is betrayed by his best friend. He thinks Marcus is sick and near death, and so this guy named Avidius Cassius goes like, I'm the emperor now. But Marcus wasn't dead, and so it puts him in this horrible position of like, obviously you can't allow this, but he doesn't want to fight a war over any, even this is an opportunity. And he says like, I want to show history how civil strife can be dealt with. He tries to give Cassius a chance to come to his senses, eventually he has to take the Roman army out in battle. And then he weeps when someone kills Cassius because it deprives him of the opportunity of giving him clemency. And he orders the Senate. He says, do not execute a single person for this. He says, do not let my name be stained in blood. My favorite story about Marcus Aurelius comes at the depths of the Antonine Plague, which is a horrible pandemic that kills millions of people. Rome's economy has been devastated. People are dying in the streets. Everyone feels like it can't possibly get better. And what does Marcus Aurelius do? He walks through the Imperial Palace and begins to mark things for sale. For two months, he sells on the lawn of the great emperor's palace, the jewels and robes and couches, the finery owned by the emperor. He's sending a message. I'm not gonna put myself first. I don't need these fancy things not when people are struggling. To me, this is like the CEO who takes a pay cut in a bad economy. This is the athlete who renegotiates their contract so the team can bring on new people. This is the leader who sacrifices and struggles, who puts the people first, not their own comfort and needs. That's what greatness is like, and that's why I love this story from Marcus Aurelius. One of the reasons Marcus was great, as we were talking about, is that he wasn't afraid to ask for help. He said, you're like a soldier storming a wall. You have a mission to accomplish. So what if you have to reach your hand up and ask a comrade for help? And that's actually where today's sponsor comes in, BetterHelp. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service. It's 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of 25,000 licensed and experienced therapists and help you with a wide range of issues. You just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences, and they match you with the right therapist from their network. And then you can talk with that therapist however you feel comfortable, text, chat, phone, or video call. And you can message your therapist at any time, schedule live sessions whenever it's convenient for you. You can switch therapists easily. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who's custom picked for you with more scheduling flexibility and at a more affordable price, get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash daily stoic, which I'll link in the description below, betterhelp.com slash daily stoic. Marcus Aurelius is not setting impossible standards for himself. He is struggling to meet the standards that he has set for himself. Let's say he's talking about temper. If we realize that he's writing to himself with no view towards publication, he's not lecturing someone else. Right. He is admonishing himself after having lost his temper. We were talking about Seneca as this hypocrite earlier. You know, Seneca had yeah. 300 ivory tables that he used for entertaining in parties. So yeah. 
yeah, like, right. this is the guy that says slavery resides under marble and gold, and right, then yeah. throws Gatsby-esque parties at his mansion yeah. subsidized by Nero. Is there <laughs> money more stained in blood than the fortune you derived working for Nero? Maybe Seneca had a sense that he was falling short and that this was something he was really struggling with. And it's only because only his essays and letters survived, none of his internal thoughts or admissions that we don't get how much he wrestled with yeah, that thing. That's so good. That's so great. He's like, what do I do with all this ivory? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How do I unload all this ivory? <laughs> Pierre Hadot, one of the great scholars, Marx Aurelius, talks about the oceanic feeling. Marx Aurelius talks about the view from above. He talks about the immensity, how all of experience escapes before us. Marcus is trying to meditate on the vastness and the connectedness of everything in the world. He talks about looking at the stars and watching yourself alongside them. I think he's seeking out these kind of humbling experiences. And you could think about why that would be so important to someone who was literally the center of the universe, the person on which so much depended on. He wanted to remind himself that that wasn't strictly true. I love bird watching and I have a bird feeder. And for a while, I found myself getting angry at the squirrels that would try to steal bird seed from the feeder. Yeah. I know many bird lovers are just fuming with anger at squirrels. I thought about this and I said to myself, you know, uh, I'm actually very closely related to squirrels. Uh, they're mammals. Sure. Uh, they do what they need to get food. Everything they're doing is entirely natural to them. And as Marcus Aurelius says, it's inappropriate to be angry at anyone for doing what's natural for them to do. It's natural for the squirrels to do this. Instead of being angry at them, I should just order a little more bird seed. I try to feel the same way about politicians I disagree with. They're like the squirrels. So they do what's natural to them. Uh, this is very much Marcus Aurelius' way yes. of dealing with people he finds objectionable. I shouldn't be ashamed of my first angry impulse, but I do think I would be should be ashamed if I let it govern my actions. I too can be selfish. I too can be ignorant. I'm just ignorant of different things. It's wrong for me to get fussy about people doing what comes naturally to them. All the great moments in Stoic history involve standing up for the little guy. Cato stands up for the little guy. Rutilius Rufus stands up for the little guy. Marcus Aurelius passes laws that not only protects Rome's slaves, he even gives wooden swords to the gladiators so they won't get hurt in the arena. We're all privileged. We all have advantages. And at different times, we're going to see ourselves in positions of power or influence where we can do something for someone. And a huge part of Stoicism is using that power, using that privilege to lessen the burden to make life easier and better for other people, right? A stoic virtue of justice. Justice is a core stoic virtue. Just that you do the right thing, the rest doesn't matter. Fruit of this life, Marx really says, good character and acts for the common good, which especially and particularly means speaking up and standing up for people who can't stand up and speak up for themselves. My father was a police officer and no way. Like, I have, as a result of that, a real intense dislike for what you might call sort of cop energy. I'm the enforcer of the law. I'm also the interpreter of said law. Yes, uh, I, the authority uh, is here. <laughs> yeah, I, I can sense how triggering it is when I hear whatever other manifestations of it in life are. If you think stoicism is kind of about an indifference or a superiority, you're missing what I think Marx Aurelius talks about most beautifully in meditations about being strict with yourself, tolerant with others, about yeah. really trying to practice empathy, leave mistakes to their makers, kind of the <laughs> opposite of that cop energy. He doesn't want his heart to harden up, which I think is what tends to happen to people in positions of that authority of the state. You start to look at other people as the enemy, almost parasites. There's that metaphor that police are the sheepdogs and the rest of us are sheep. Yes. There are three types of people in this world, sheep, wolves, and sheepdogs. I contrast that to stoicism it's probably better we not think of ourselves as sheep or sheepdogs or wolves. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's just like those things are powerful. They really are attractive and powerful. They'll work in our thinking. Probably should avoid that classification. It's not a chore to be a Stoic. It's a joy to be a Stoic. It's great to live according to your own principles, to live up to your own standards, to look for a good life well lived, to understand the essence of eudaimonia. Discipline is part of the reward. If you're not getting that, then you're gonna be Stoic in an unhappy way, in a, in a way that doesn't actually give you the satisfaction that you seek. I think that's very well said, right? If you think that they're gonna throw you a parade at the end of your life because you were disciplined and temperate, you're not only gonna be rudely surprised, you know, 
know, Marcus Aurelius reminds himself of the worthlessness of posthumous fame. I think about this when you take a president like Harry Truman. He makes all these incredibly difficult decisions that were almost universally unpopular at the time. The fact that he's vindicated several generations now and is now considered to be a consequential great president, he doesn't get any of the posthumous satisfaction of that. And so my point is not that he should have been a more Epicurean president, that he should have done the easier, more expedient thing. It's that you have to get to a place where you do the right thing because it's the right thing and you enjoy it because it was the right thing. Even if you are criticized and disliked for it, that has to be irrelevant to you. I hope you like this video. I hope you subscribe. But what I really want you to subscribe to is our daily Stoic email, one bit of Stoic wisdom, totally for free to the largest community of Stoics ever in existence. You can sign up at dailystoic.com slash email. There's no spam. You can unsubscribe at any time. I love sending it. I've sent it every day for the last six years. And I hope to see you there at dailystoic.com slash email.